Jesus is alive, right? That's why we're here. He is risen from the grave, from the cross to the grave to life. And we know this changes everything. But why does it change everything? We're going to look at that today. When you see that Jesus is risen from the grave, fear is replaced with confidence in the believer's life. Defeat is replaced by victory, despair by hope, and weeping by joy. And I thank God for what he's done through his son, Jesus Christ, and what we're here today to do to worship him. You know, as we were together last week on Palm Sunday, we looked at our Lord's words that he said, I must be killed. And we looked what that meant and saw that Jesus, with this divine must on his life, he traveled to Jerusalem first because he was going to suffer much there in Jerusalem. And then he was going to be crucified. He was going to be killed for you, for me, where he would pay the penalty of sin. We cannot let that lose the magnitude. How many of you have sinned last week? Maybe even today, Jesus paid the penalty for that, and that penalty of perishing eternally. You know, when you think about it, if you had to associate one word with the cross, I think we could associate one word very clearly the word love. If you could associate one word to the cross, you may say cruel, mean, harsh, murder, all these things, but ultimately love. That the Father would love you, would love me so much that he would send his son for me, for you. And that the son would love us enough to voluntarily lay down his life for us. The magnitude of that love is incomprehensible because God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. But thank God, Jesus' words did not end with, I must be killed. We're gonna look at that today. If his words had ended with, I must be killed, we would serve a dead Savior. And therefore, just like all other faiths that place their hope, we would be placing our faith in a dead man. And we're going to see what the Bible says, what that would look like if that were the case. Let's look again together at Matthew chapter 16, 21, where we see this divine must. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Aren't you thankful he didn't end with, I must be killed? That that was the finality of his mission, his purpose, his ministry? But that he went on to say, the very thing that would complete that mission, the mission that actually changed everything for the world, I must be raised on the third day. Amen. And just as certainly as he was killed when he said, I must be killed, just as certainly he was raised when he said, I must be raised. And praise God for that. Death could not hold him, and the grave could not keep him. And I could sit here today and show you all kinds of evidence that Jesus rose from the uh, dead. But we're not going to do that today because here we just state the truth that he rose from the dead because the Word of God says so. And if you want to know more, you can come to me. I'll give you all kinds of uh, evidence proving that very thing. Imagine there in that tomb lays the body of Christ. It's dark in there. Picture it, how dark it is. Think of the silence in the tomb. Just the body laying there for three days. There he is. He was laying there dead. What was it like when 
Jesus sat up. He stood up and he left the grave. He left the, sa- the, the tomb as the Savior of the world, Almighty God, that the earth shook and angels came. Can you imagine if you had had the privilege to be there at that moment? Wow, that's what he did. So if love is the one word we associate with the cross, what is one word we can associate with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I think certainly that word would be hope. Hope. Love, he went to the cross. The resurrection gives us certain hope, and we're going to see this today. Not a worldly hope so, but a heavenly certain hope guaranteed to us by God himself. Hebrews 6.19 tells us that in the resurrected Jesus, this hope we have as a very anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. Praise God for that. Jesus said, I must be raised. I must be raised. Why? That we who place our faith in him might have hope in a risen Savior as the very anchor for our souls as we move through this choppy waters of life and the threatening waves of the sea of life, arriving to glory one day, just as he said he would bring us to glory. That is our certain hope in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen? So this morning, we're going to do something a little different on Easter messages. I want to look at five reasons why Jesus said, I must be raised, and the hope that comes with each of these reasons, Jesus must be raised. I thank you, Lord Jesus, today that we are celebrating you, a risen Savior, and the reasons you must be raised. Lord, let us take great joy in the grace of your gifts, the grace of your love, and the mercy that you, take, that you uh, have towards each one of us. Lord, we praise you for our salvation. We give you all glory, and may you be magnified today. We praise you, Jesus, in your name, amen. So the first thing I want you to see is Jesus must be raised if we are to have hope in the cross of Jesus Christ. We saw last week that Jesus said, I must be killed, right? That is, I must suffer death as your substitute that I may pay the penalty for your sin. Wow. So that you may be freed from just condemnation. Mm. That is a fundamental plank in our hope as believers that Jesus died for our sins. That Jesus paid for them all. Every last sin, no matter how big, no matter how small. And maybe you're here today and saying, I've sinned so much, there is nothing anyone could do to pay for that. I must pay for that myself. I'm here to tell you, you can't, but Jesus can. We see the sin, the debt of sin is death. You know, how many of you are happy when a debt in life is paid off and you get the paid in full? ticket. You like that? Oh yeah, when you pay off a car loan and then you have the actual title in your little file. Hey, that's done. That is a small example of what the debt of your sin is when Christ stamps paid in full on it. Paid in full. We must realize that if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, Instead of hope that he paid for all of our sins, instead of hope that he satisfied the very wrath of God for those sins, we would have serious doubts of what he did on Calvary with those claims. Instead of hope, uh, Jesus must be killed, he died. Did he really pay for all my sins. Well, we do not need to doubt, for 
He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. It's through that raising, that resurrection, that he can offer salvation and we are justified that the price of sin has been paid because he did enough on Calvary when he shed his blood, because he paid for all our transgressions and sins in his death. Therefore, he was raised, everyone, as proof that God the Father accepted that sacrifice. God accepted that sacrifice in Jesus' raising from the dead. And he can say it's paid in full. Think about it. If any sin had not been paid for on the cross, Jesus could not have risen from the grave. It would not have been finished. One unpaid sin would have kept him in the tomb because what he did on the cross would not have satisfied the payment for all sin. Hear me now. Listen. Christ's resurrection assures what Christ's death secures. Take that to the bank. It assures what his death secures for us, his resurrection. Praise God. Therefore, what can we sing with confidence? We can sing with confidence that Jesus paid it all. Therefore, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. Thank God for what he did and why he must be raised. Because one day you, like Jude 24 says, will stand in the presence of his great glory, blameless with great joy. Does that make you happy? So first, Jesus must be raised if we are to have hope in the cross of Jesus Christ. Next, he must be raised if we are to have hope in the person of Jesus. What do you mean by that? Here we go. Jesus, as we saw last week, was fully human, and he was fully God. All right? He was the Son of Man, the Son of God. In fact, the Bible said of Jesus that he was, we see this at Christmas time, Emmanuel, God with us, right? So as the Son, as God the Son, think about what Jesus did as you read through the epistles, the miracles that he, wor- that he worked. He walked on water. He turned water to wine. He gave bread to the hungry. He gave sight to the blind. He gave healing to the crippled, to the paraplegic. He gave hearing to the deaf health to the sick. He even raised people from the dead to life, and so much more. So as God the Son, Jesus made, when he did these miracles and as he walked in his ministry, he made some astonishing, remarkable comments and claims about himself. Somebody has counted over 130 of them, but he claimed what? To be I am who existed before Abraham. What a claim. What a claim. But to me, one of the most astonishing claims as well that Jesus ever made was a claim that only God himself could make and that that he was going to raise himself from the dead. Can you imagine making such a claim for yourself knowing that death is imminent? Jesus answers them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. John 2, 19, he said in John 10, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, everyone, and I have authority to take it up again. So, okay, this commandment I received from my Father. Think about it. All the miracles of Christ, all the claims that he made about himself would be nothing but fodder if he was still in the grave. For if the grave could hold him, 
then there was a greater power than him. Death would be more powerful than him. And he could not have been God, for there is no power greater than God. And he would not have been the person he claimed to be if he had no power over death. So it gives us hope in the person of Jesus Christ that he is God, that he is who he said he is. Wow. You know, when it comes to our true faith and the resurrection, Paul himself, he put it very bluntly. He just laid it out there exactly in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, and if Christ had not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished then. If we had hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Wow. But thank God Paul doesn't leave it there. He goes on in verse 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. He has been raised. Therefore, what? Our faith is not worthless, everybody. Our faith is priceless. Everything about him gives us the hope in who Jesus is because of his resurrection. You can put all your hope in the person of Jesus, everyone. You can put all your hope in exactly what he did for you on that cross whom you can have complete confidence in and complete trust in every single word he says and everything he yet promises still to do, you can believe. So Jesus must be raised if we are to have hope in the cross of Jesus if we are to have hope in the person of Jesus. Now, Jesus must be raised if we are to have hope in the life of Jesus. What is the hope in the life of Jesus, and why did this resurrection guarantee that hope? Let's face it. What is the one thing that we all have in common? The one thing we all have in common, everyone, is every one of us here is facing death. Every single one of us is facing death. That is where each of us is headed sooner or later. How many of you know, bar the rapture, you are headed to death? We're going to die. Sooner or later. But are you going to die today? Is today the day? People without Christ are in a perilous condition. And they don't even know the precipice they hang over. The Bible calls death exactly what it is in 1 Corinthians 15, an enemy. It's the enemy, a greater enemy than any power on earth. Death, when you think about it, is the ultimate terrorist in life, bringing to the world so much heartache, so much sorrow, tears, pain. Death shatters lives. It terminates the hopes and the dreams that anyone would have in this world. Wow, it's the greatest of tragedies and life's most frightening experience to many. But we must say this resurrection of Jesus Christ does something about death. Praise the Lord, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything for the believer and changes nothing for the non-believer. He says in John 14, 19, Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. Oh, praise God, you rose yourself from the dead. There is no eternal life without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Acts 2, 24 said, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. 
since it was impossible, here we go, for him to be held by its power because he is who he says he is. He is God. He's all powerful and he raised him from himself from the dead and it was impossible for death's power to hold him there. And he says, because I live, you can have life. Mm. Therefore, to the believer who puts their faith and their trust in this one and only Savior who loved them, the agony of death has been ended for the believer. The power of death over the believer is now broken. Oh, for sure, the heartache still comes. Yes, there is still great sorrow. Yes, we weep when a loved one dies, but we do not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For we believe Jesus died and rose again, and he gives me eternal life. Therefore, when I die absent from the body because of Jesus' resurrection, present with the Lord. But think about the sadness, the sorrow. I used to be in this condition. Those without a belief that he is who he says he is. Think about this. For those who have no hope, those who do not believe in Jesus, and I don't mean believe that he existed. What I mean is believe that he is who he says he is, that he accomplished what he said he accomplished, that he did what he said he did, and have placed all their faith and hope in the lordship of Jesus Christ as their savior in their life. Wow. For everyone without hope, which is those without Jesus, death truly is the loss of everything. But it doesn't have to be that way. But for those of us who believe that Jesus died and rose again, Paul says it's not actually no longer conquering you or have power over you, but something else. That it is actually a gain, because when we depart this world, we will be with Jesus, who is alive. And Paul says, that is very much better. <laughs> that is very much better. Are you looking forward to the very much better? What a hope we have in the face of death. A hope squarely based upon the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, dead saviors, they offer no hope in the face of death for all who follow them. The dead can't help the dead. The founders of every single major religion in the world are dead, except the one true faith, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because our Savior is what? Huh? All right. Remember, he's here. He's sitting right here looking at you. He's there. He, he's here. Jesus, you're here, and we thank you, and we know you're alive. Amen. The resurrected Jesus, who is here, says this to us. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, that's physically. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he means spiritually. And he says, do you believe this? And I say, I do. I do. I believe it. You must have to ask yourself your answer. If you do, then because of Jesus' resurrection, you have a certain hope of life. If you do not, you certainly have no hope for life. Think about this. Death to the believer brings certain guaranteed hope, but death to those without Jesus only brings hopelessness. Hopelessness. And Jesus says, my resurrection takes away the lessness. And gives you hope. D.L. Moody said, one day you're going to read in the papers that I'm dead. But don't you believe it, he said. Don't you believe it, for at that moment I will be more alive than I have ever been. 
That's exactly right for the believer in Jesus Christ because of his resurrection, amen? So we see Jesus had to be raised, he must be raised, if we were to hope in the cross of him, if we're to have hope in the person of Jesus, if we're to have hope in the life of Jesus. Now Jesus must be raised if we're to have hope in the prophecies about Jesus. When the Apostle Paul, I mean when the Apostle, not the Apostle Paul, but when the Apostles went to the tomb, what happened? They were shocked, weren't they? That his body was not there. Many years later, John, in describing the shock of the disciples, he said this, for as yet they did not understand what? The scriptures, that he must rise again from the dead. They did not understand the scripture. And Jesus also, he actually used scripture concerning himself after he rose from the dead, after he rose from the dead, appearing to the two men on the road to Emmaus. They were hoping, it says in verse 21, that Jesus would redeem Israel then and there. But their hope was shattered. They said when Jesus was sentenced to death and crucified in verse 20. And what did Jesus say to them? Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he used the word of God. He explained to them the things concerning himself and all of Scripture. Wow. You see, it was all necessary Jesus must be killed, and he must be raised. He must enter into his glory to fulfill all that the prophets have spoken. Why, you may say. In verse 27, all the scriptures about himself. We know this line, history is just his story. Jesus goes on to say, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now he adds the Psalms. Then he did something. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning right here with Jerusalem. Oh, you foolish men, don't you know this has been written about from beginning? Think about this. Over the past two weeks until today, Jesus has occupied the spotlight on the world stage. His crucifixion which is an event which all of our calendars are set by. And his resurrection is being recognized, celebrated, and even debated in much of the world. There has not been one person in all of history that has had a greater impact upon the world than Jesus Christ. Robert G. Lee, not E. G. Lee said, taking Jesus out of history is like taking matter out of physics. Heat out of fire, fragrance out of flowers, numbers out of mathematics, mind out of metaphysics, and cause and effect out of philosophy. Where would you be if Jesus was taken out of your life? Where would the world be if Jesus Christ didn't love the world and come for us? The death and the resurrection of Jesus, everyone, is the fulfillment of prophecy concerning these very things. And therefore, it gives us hope that every other piece of Scripture is true as well. For if he hadn't been risen, uh, if he didn't rise from the dead, Scripture would be false. Everything about the kingdom to come and the glory that will come to those who follow him will happen to everyone 
just as the Bible says. God's word is the rock of unchangeable absolute truth and gives us the one true path to follow in this life. So therefore, Easter changed everything for the hope of mankind. It took place just as the unchangeable rock of the word of God said. And therefore, without that resurrection, you could have no hope in the prophecies of God's word. Wow, praise God. We serve a risen Savior and he's given us his living word. So we must be raised. Jesus must be raised if we are to have hope in the cross of Jesus, hope in the person of Jesus, hope in the life of Jesus, hope in the prophecies about Jesus. And next, the fifth, Jesus must be raised if we are to have hope in the presence of Jesus with us today. The resurrection of Jesus is not just about the next life to everybody, the afterlife, but it's also about this life. The resurrection of Jesus gives us hope during all of our trials and all of our tribulations and all the things you may be dealing with in life. His resurrection gives you hope that he's with us today. He's not in a grave. He's alive and dwells within us. Jesus said, I am with you always. A dead Savior cannot do that. Dead people are just that, dead. But Jesus is alive, and he says, I live in you. He's with us every moment. He's here, as I said, with us right now, and you can trust him in every situation in life. Maybe you find yourself today in a situation that seems hopeless or feels hopeless. Maybe you're in a situation where you think it's impossible to resolve or to escape from. But even if not, trust me, it may come. But when these times occur in our life, let the resurrection of Jesus Christ give you hope. For we do not want you to be unaware, Paul said, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril and will will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. Why did he have such great hope in God? Because his God is alive and rose himself from the dead so he can take care of my trial. Wow. Paul describes an affliction that came on him and Timothy where they were so burdened excessively it was beyond their strength. They were in such a desperate peril and in such a desperate situation that they thought themselves as good as dead. It appeared hopeless. They thought it was over. But you know, in those times of your life, when you see there is the God who raises the dead, and that is your God and your Savior, you will be able to say, Like Paul, he delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope. All these five points today are the hope that we have from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whom do you set your hope on, especially in your trials? Wow. Is there anything? (laughs) I mean, this is a rhetorical question. It's a no duh. Is there anything too hard for God who can raise himself from the dead? No, I think not. That is the one who was with us, who said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. How we need to learn and remember these things to trust him in our deliverance. Think about this. God put them in that situation, in that trial, beyond their strength, beyond their resources for a reason. Because he does not want us to trust in ourselves, He wants us to trust in him, the very God who raised himself from the dead. Therefore, he wants you to be able to say like the song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, 
all fear is gone. Because he lives, I know who holds the future. Oh, yeah, life is worth the living just because he lives. Wow. You see, the last two weeks, we've looked at this divine must. I must be killed. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Where would I be if my sins weren't paid for? I must be raised. Thank you, Jesus, for the tomb left behind. Because of your resurrection, Lord, I have hope in the cross of Jesus. I have hope in the person of Jesus. I have hope in the life of Jesus. I have hope in the prophecies of Jesus. And I have hope in the presence of Jesus with me today, all because he lives. Right? As we close, my friends, let me close with this. You remember last week, we saw that Jesus asked Peter a question. He asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Is there any more important question than the answer to that one? Is there any more important question, I mean, with whatever your answer, the ramifications of that answer? Jesus is asking you today, those of you who may be tuning in, those of you here today, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who am I? Do you believe him? Right now, he invites you. He says, God so loved the world that he gave me to you, his son, that if you believe in me, and who I say I am and what I say I did and what I've accomplished on your behalf, you will not perish, that you will have everlasting life. But who do you say that I am? You have to remember and know that he loves you. And he says, will you believe in me? Will you accept my payment on your behalf? Will you take from me my love, my gift that's free that you cannot earn? Will you allow my blood to wash you white as snow and clean you and present you and reconcile you back to the Father and present you and restore your relationship with him because it's a bridge you can't get over, but I've made it for you? Who do you say that I am? Please accept me. As the praise team comes forward, I want every head to bow and every eye to close. Maybe you're here today and you made a profession of faith a long time ago, but you haven't been living your life the way our risen Savior would want you to live. Today, right there, pray, Lord, forgive me, for he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And maybe today you say, I'm going to pray that and allow your spirit to lead in my life. Maybe you would like to come forward today and rededicate your life. Maybe you're live streaming in, or you're here today and you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray with you. This is the day we celebrate his resurrection. He wants to give you certain guaranteed hope of eternal life. You can pray with me. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe who you are, that you're the Son of God. I have sinned against you, and I do not deserve your forgiveness or your love. I cannot earn it. 
but Lord, it's you who loved me. I believe that you paid the price for every one of my sins, and I ask you now to forgive me for them. Lord Jesus, please save me. Please give me your life. Make me clean and make me yours. Receive me as your child and give me the eternal life because of your resurrected life and what you did. I give myself to you. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. If you did that this morning with every head bowed, let me see. Lord, I thank you today that we serve a risen Savior, that you are alive. I thank you, Lord, that we prayed that prayer, and Lord, it's not just words, but we mean it because it's truth, and that you have washed us white as snow. I thank you that we serve a risen Savior. Let us go out into the world and proclaim your name. Let us live our lives worthy for you. Lord, let us yield our hearts to your spirit and all we say and all we do. Lord, death is imminent unless you return, so we look forward to coming home to you. But use us for your purposes here, Lord, for you are the Savior of the world. And there is a lost and dying world out there who desperately needs to hear you. I pray for everyone here today, for Lord, those who may have made a decision to receive you. Guide them and lead them and let us minister with them. For the rest of us, Lord, who know you as our Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that we yield to you and that we give you great joy, that our hearts are overflowing with praise to you, seeing the resurrection and what that means to us. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done, what you currently do in our life, and what you're yet to do now and in the glory to come. We praise you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing to